So, a perimeter overflow. Oh, now we're going there. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So, a perimeter overflow pool versus vanishing edge pool. How would you describe the difference? Uh, a clear glass filled all the way up and overflowing around the entire glass. Okay. So, there's no edge in the fact that it's going over and vanishing in one spot. Right. It's the, in the entire body of water. The entire vessel is being overflowed. Yep. Okay. So why would you do that? Well, because it looks pretty spectacular. It's a great water feature. I mean, it's not necessarily a loud one, but it, it, it's a cool look. Um, one of the things I like about it, I, I will just say that elevated spas, um, typically with a spillway, you're going to have some challenges around that spillway. With a perimeter overflow spa, we plumb them so that there's water going over it all the time. So that is always wet. And that tile, at least in my experience, when the stuff is installed and built the right way, does much better if it's wet literally all the time, unless you're just draining the spa or you're taking some water out of it for maintenance purposes. Okay. Keeping it wet all the time. The drying and getting wet again and that back and forth constant can be problematic. Okay. So... Primary overflow spa would be where it flows over all the sides of the spa versus a primary overflow pool does the whole thing. Well, that's or, the same thing, isn't it? Same thing, just two different vessels. Right, and they're, they're built differently. So uh, what's cool to me is the water and the deck are now at the same exact plane. Yeah, it looks really good. So, Especially with that mirror effect we were talking about on the vanishing edge pools. Right. So you don't see the side of the coping or the three inch drop down to the tile. So it just gives more reflection. It takes kind of a, a layer out in between those two and it gives you a, a more spectacular effect. So when you run it on all four sides, what if you're on a hillside? Then you could use the bottom as a basin or a surge tank and have three sides of it as perimeter overflow and maybe the fourth side if there's four sides to it if it's a geometric style pool that's the vanishing edge basin okay so you could have a hybrid yeah and it's it, it actually works really good okay so one of the things that uh moses he's one of the people we talked to about mm -hmm. different thoughts great designer so moses Love brought up that it's really cool to do a perimeter overflow and bring turf up to the edge. Oh, the for sure. Because now you've removed the coping, mm -hmm. and so now we have grass and water in the same plane. Yep. So that's a really spectacular look. Great contrast, too. I mean, green grass and a black pool. Yeah. That's some contrast. I mean, it looks like a mirror is just laying out on the, on, the, on the lawn. It's a great look. Yeah, so that's a really cool effect. And that's, I think, part of just going off off on a little tangent here, part of, you know, working with a designer, they're going to show you all this stuff and, and how it works and, and really what is the best way to do it. All right. So when you have a perimeter overflow pool without, on all four sides, the water has to go somewhere. Yes. Are you, are you questioning me? Am I answering questions now? Sure. I'm teasing you. Would you like to answer? Yes, you need to have a surge tank. And okay. essentially a vanishing edge pool, the basin is a surge tank. Okay. So we've got to have a, a tank that's generally buried below the ground somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a secret hatchway to get into it. Yes, you do. So, and this tank, everything's going in it. So the same as with the basin where you're going to filter it and sanitize it yep. and do all the things that you do, you know, are going to have that same process where the water is going in there. Absolutely. Okay. So. So would it need to be sized? Properly. Yeah. I'd say hydraulics are even more important in this mm -hmm. structural situation. The, the other thing that comes into play is I would never, ever, ever not peer a perimeter overflow. Pool. Oh no. No, no, that's, that's just, I mean, if it moves a 16th of an inch, it's not going to work anymore. 
Yeah, I mean, imagine a 20 by 40 rectangle. So that's 120 feet of edge. Right. And our tolerance is... I mean, you can be good, but, you know... It really uh, needs to be... Yeah, I mean, look at it this way, I guess, is let's just say that you had an eighth of an inch tolerance. So you have to make up for that eighth of an inch and provide a meniscus flow. So you've got to be taller than the wall in order to get an equal flow across that vanishing edge. And in this case where we're talking about a perimeter overflow, I mean, you just, there's no margin of error. So, but it's spectacular looking. Mm, yeah. So, but you, you have to, the structural and the hydraulics and the engineering play, even if it was at a high level before, or even at a higher level here. So, to say this is going to cost a little bit more than a vanishing edge pool, it's a definite situation that there's going to be an increased cost. Oh, it's an understatement for yeah. sure. Because, I mean, let's look at it logically. You have on a vanishing edge pool, you have, you know, your vanishing edge weir, and then you have your basin and your separate equipment, and you're doing all your calculations based off of the length of the weir. And in a perimeter overflow, you got the entire pool to deal with. Right. Totally different. So, uh, again, there's people that are like, oh, that can't be that hard to build. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I've seen or heard is the gurgling. Oh, yeah. That comes into play with this pool. And people think that the water is going to run silently over the edge, but because they didn't set up the proper hydraulic situation, now the water actually gurgles. So explain to people why it gurgles. Well, the water's trying to flow through the system and there's not enough air in the system to allow it to flow smoothly. Right. And so it gurgles as it goes through there. And so you have this pristine, beautiful look that sounds like someone's gargling. Mm -hmm. It's not a very pristine sound. Yeah, because it doesn't go away. No. You're stuck with it. Yes. So again, very, very critical that you're dealing with somebody that has some know-how to build this structure. So, well, and there's, there's quite a few different, I think, um, ways to build these. I mean, you've seen, I think uh, for a lot of the pros out there, you know, they've tried to figure out better ways to build these things. And so we've got companies that produce products for it. And then we've got people that are, you know, developing their own systems. And what happens, what Mike is explaining is that when the water is flowing through these pipes and there's no airflow through the pipes, it sort of creates a little bit of a vacuum in there. And that's causing the flow of the water to change, which is causing the gurgling. Right. So what are some things that a homeowner should think about in this process if they're going to consider this? Other than there's going to be greater costs. We're going to have to locate a surge tank somewhere. Uh, is there particular products that they're going to want to use to bring that water and deck surface together? Uh, it can be a, a deck or it can be, it can be done in wood. I've On seen a commercial it. pool, it can be done with grates. Yeah. So that's a little bit different look. It's a totally different look. So, but that's where. But that's that. where people could get an idea of what a perimeter overflow pool looks like. Yeah. One thing with a perimeter overflow pool is what happens to the surge when a bunch of people jump in the pool? Mm -hmm. Where does it go? On a perimeter overflow pool, it would go into the basin, whether it was a surge tank or not, or maybe out of the pool or up onto the deck. Yeah, so when I built them. That's a good point because you're talking about the little tiny slot all the way around. If you can ball, it doesn't matter what you do, that water's going all over the place. So you have to pitch the decks yes. back into the, the pool. pool. So when the surge occurs, it runs up on the sidewalk or the patio, and then it'll go back into the pool. Typically, decks slope away from a swimming yes. pool or slope towards drains in the deck. Well, you don't want the water leaving here, mm -mm. okay? You're losing enough in evaporation, so you want to actually slope it back towards the, the slot itself. Yep. Uh, so usually depend, you know, I think three to four feet is what we usually look at as a starting point for that situation. Yeah, I was thinking at least three feet for sure. Yeah. So what are some other things that people need to think about uh, with that particular style of pool? 
Well, you know, I think the the point on a vanishing edge, or not a vanishing edge, but a perimeter overflow is it's kind of its beautiful simplicity. Right. I mean, you're you're essentially, I think, on that style of pool, building like what we talked about, a reflecting pool. Right. right. And it looks the best when there's no water flow on it. So in a way, and you know, having a bunch of water features on it, which you could have, you just turn them off. And the same thing with lots of elements around it. Usually it's simple. Uh, yeah, because it's a detraction. Right. You don't want to put a bunch of fire features by it uh, or water features generally because they could detract. Although they might be able to reflect some cool lighting or something oh, yeah, like that. Yeah, the fire features create cool. But, you know, the uh, it, it's just you have to understand... And most people have seen the picture. They're, they're trying to achieve that. They're not trying to add things. But sometimes one spouse wants to do certain things. Another one wants to do different things. And you don't want to take away from the, the effect that you're trying to have. Sure. So now a perimeter overflow spa, how's that work? Is there certain things you want to think about with that? Well, there are two different things because the perimeter overflow pool is a slot all the way around it because it has pipe running all the way around it or a gutter system running all the way around it. How that's configured probably depends on your pool builder. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. There's a best way to do it. Um, and then the perimeter overflow spa, I mean, the, the trough is the pool. Yeah. So you're, you're flowing into the pool, mm -hmm. but then you may have to build a trough around it on three mm -hmm. sides. Yep. So it captures the water. Oh, one thing to go back to, uh, can a perimeter overflow pool be elevated? Yes. Okay. So then you have a glistening body of water that's... A cube. A, if it's a rectangle, you mm -hmm. know, a cube floating up out of the... That, I mean, that that's something that people look at and they're like, how in the world does that work? Well, yeah. Another thing is you put a spa in a black perimeter overflow pool and set the beam height of the spa just barely, I mean, literally within a fraction of an inch at the water level in the pool. There's a couple of different ways to do this because you can actually hide a spa in a perimeter overflow pool and draw the water down to expose it and then isolate it to heat it up. Right. And it kind of looks cool because it looks like there's, you know, a bunch of bubbles out in the middle of a pool that's completely calm. It's a visual effect. It's yet another thing. I mean, if you have parties, if you have, if you entertain a lot, you know, what kind of features are we putting in your, in your yard, in your project that are going to compel people to say, wow, or to talk about, or how did you do that? Or how is this done? So what you're saying is the spa could be either elevated ever so slightly above the pool. So you get this little rim mm -hmm. of water that's floating up maybe a half inch to an inch above the, the water of the pool. Or you could design it where it's lower, but then you actually remove water from the pool to now expose the spa when you heat it? Into a separate surge tank, yeah. Okay. So that those are both cool. So anyway, I just wanted I forgot about that. Wanted to point that out. It doesn't have to be, you know, the the perimeter overflow doesn't have to be level. No. It could be also raised uh, as right. well. So a lot of perimeter overflow spas are going to be raised whether a minute level or you know, they could be raised six or twelve or eighteen inches above the pool, which is the basin. And well, and you have to consider how they're getting in and out of it. That's, Certainly. That's where we start talking about should it be raised or lowered. And then depending on that configuration is going to dictate kind of the configuration of the spa because you need it to be safe to get to, safe to get in and out of. So I find that either keeping it level or slightly above mm -hmm. the water level or raised 18. Seat wall height. Seat wall height is a comfortable way to do it. And I've oh. seen people do a lot of different things. I've seen people set this perimeter overflow spa out in a large body of water where there's floating pads that they walk mm -hmm. out to Love that. the spa. So that's kind of a cool look. Uh, some people want to try to sit near the edge of it. And so the channel may be actually underneath the coping. So the water runs down, but you can walk right up to the edge and sit on the edge. Now, the first time I did a perimeter overflow spa was uh, for a uh, parade of homes. Mm. And when we were, people all kept going up 
and sitting on the edge of it because they didn't realize there was water running over and it. And they all got wet. And they all got mm-hmm. wet. There's water always running over the side. Yes. It's just, it, there's not a lot of sound with this feature if you're running over smooth tile on the sides. So I've had clients that recently are like, well, I want sound as well as the reflective top. And so we've incorporated something textured on the sides. Mm -hmm. So as the water runs over the sides, there's a little bit of water movement, therefore a little bit of water sound. Like stack slate? Something like that? Yeah, I've done things like that. I've done textured tiles. Um, So there's a number of different things. You can create a texture on the side, but if it's just a smooth tile that it's running over, you're not getting any sound from that. True. You know, so... Um, a lot of times people want a feature they're thinking of sound and visual effects, you know, just understand what you're going to get there. So the channel that runs around this spa, I've had people that want to leave that open. And so there's a couple of challenges with that is how's that being cleaned Mm -hmm. and is that being lighted? Because we'd like to see light on the side walls of the spa as the water is going over it in the evening. Sure. So, so I think what you're saying is that if you do a perimeter overflow spa, there's probably some things that you need to really take into consideration to do while you're doing that. Yeah. So one of the things that I had a client at the very beginning, one of the first ones I did is we had, uh, an all tile, uh, spa inside. Then we had tile on the outside and we had tile on the water line of the channel, but in the floor of the channel, we had pebble sheen. Right. And he was like, why in the world didn't you take the tile through there? Would have looked a whole lot better to, you know, take the tile across that section of the floor. You know, you just had to drop a couple inches more down with tile Mm -hmm. and then tile that floor and tile it back up. And I was like, Never thought of it before. And he's like, well, how much does it cost? And I told him, and he's like, oh, yeah, let's tile the whole thing. And so I've offered that to clients since then, and almost every single one of them is like, oh, yeah, let's tile that. That would look a whole lot better than, you know, having the pebble in that area. Mm -hmm. So there's just little details to think about when you're, you know, doing finishes. I think it could look both ways. I like the look of um, of like a glass tile on a top step anyway. I think it it really creates a unique um, visual, especially during the day with the sun shining, because it'll sparkle in the water, which is a contrast with, say, like a black interior finish. Correct. So like a dark iridescent, you know, kind of rainbowish color iridescent tile can can look kind of cool. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, which gets into also that top step, the water doesn't reflect as much. And so it's just usually, not as deep. Right. It's yeah. a, l- a little bit different look. So you pick a tile that blends with more with the watercolor of the pool that pieces blend together a little bit better sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, the weir on how it's done on a perimeter overflow spa, I generally do it the same way as I do a pool where it's angled with the top on the uh, highest on the outside and sloping into the middle because it makes the spa look bigger. Yeah. So when I do an 11 by 11 outside, that's what it is versus an eight by eight on the inside. The other thing is, as you said, it keeps a, you know, the water's not running over that weir all the time and it's just totally underwater all the time. So from a maintenance standpoint, it looks a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So more surface area to reflect as well. Absolutely. So, uh, it looks really cool, too, to have a cube with a round spa in the center of it. You've done that. I've seen that. So, yes, that it does look really it's, cool. It's a, it's a neat look. Yeah. It's a neat look. It also creates that, you know, you could sit on the side of it or whatever, but it's 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 really unique. And inside the spa, I mean, sitting on a curved wall all the way around is a little more comfortable than a straight wall, too. Sure. So you can con- you can combine them. So then everybody's facing each other as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice, from a gathering standpoint, versus looking down the bleacher. And there's a bunch of considerations on doing that. Certainly. Okay. Other cool things to think with other perimeter overflow features. Well, here's, so if there's something to, 
that you need to know is that if you have any spa, you need what's called a Hartford loop. That Hartford loop helps everything work much better. And if you have a perimeter overflow spa out in the middle of the pool somewhere, that can't go there. So it's got to be hidden somewhere. So you, you, you have to find a place for it. So a column. I call them a Hartford loop and it's called something else here. Oh, I call it a I think it's loop. called a spa loop. Or an air loop. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. So, but if you put a column, something that, you know, you can get it up. Inside, put it inside. Right. Hidden in a column. An outdoor kitchen with it inside a cabinet. Right. So you have to have it. So what that does is that's where you're using a blower. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you had the pipe for the blower fill up with water all the way back to the pool equipment. When you turn the blower on, the blower is never blowing all that water out of there. And that's why your blower is mounted higher than your pool equipment in case anybody was wondering. Yeah. So if you have a Hartford loop, the closer you can have it to the spa, that's the distance that's filled up with water. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to blow out as much. And so you want it as short a distance as possible. Right. So it blows out the pipes. So your jets work like they're supposed to. And if you leave it on, it will, you know, supercharge them somewhat, but it's going to probably bounce a lot of water all over the place. Yeah. So my wife loves that effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do too. You mentioned in this process, pebble. Mm-hmm. So I think that should be our word of the day. What is pebble? Yes. Okay. So I think... It's something people are like, what What are they talking about? So Pebble would be an aggregate pool finish. And there is Pebble Technology, which was the original people that came out of Australia. Their, their uh, headquarters actually in the U.S. is in Scottsdale. So I'm very familiar with them. Great organization. Um, they came out with what was called Pebble Tech, you know, probably 30 years ago now. Right. Yeah. You know, and Pebble Tech was, you know, a large, larger aggregate stone and unfortunately what happened in the industry is is it all gets lumped into one and so different companies have different specifications for product and some have a higher specification than others so i've had in the past especially in phoenix as we did so many uh, pebble tech pools you know people would just throw well, i don't want pebble because it's it's really rough well what i'm saying is that some are rougher than others and so in the early 2000s, Pebble technology came out with what's called Pebble Sheen. Correct. And the Pebble Sheen is a smaller aggregate, so it's a little bit smooth, more smooth. Now, this can be diamond polished, but it, it, you almost don't need it unless you want a perfectly smooth surface, which I don't necessarily think makes the most sense, but you could. You could. And in fact, my, a pool that I built in 2003 was the second Pebble Sheen pool done in the U.S., and it was Bordeaux. Beautiful color. It looked great, but it was a very natural looking pool with lots of flagstone decking and natural rock waterfalls and a massive, massive um, sun shelf. I mean, multi-level sun shelf with water features. So Pebble, so a lot of people say Pebble Tech Mm -hmm. when they talk about a pool finish. It's like saying Coke. Yeah. It's, you know, or Kleenex or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's actually the manufacturer that people use as the descriptive. And so some people use the word pebble uh, just as, uh, so it's not pebble tech. And what the, the one thing I I also have used pebble tech since it came out uh, stateside. And when you're using pebble tech, all the applicators have to be certified. Yes. And so that certification process, I explained to people, the really cool thing about it is I can take a sample of pebble sheen, comes in a little triangle. And I can throw it in your pool. You probably won't be able to find it Mm -hmm. because all the pool will be finished like that sample. Exactly the same. Now, I've had to use, when I came back to Texas uh, from California, there were only two applicators in the Metroplex that did Pebble Sheen and Pebble Tech. And so they could pick and choose the companies they wanted to work with. And they're like, we really don't want to work with you, Mike. And I'm like, why? They said, well... Your projects are massive yeah. and our guys can do two small jobs a day mm-hmm. versus doing your one job a day. And since we pay them by their work, they'd rather do the two small pools. So we don't want to do your pools. And I called the Pebble Tech president and said, Hey, listen, I dealt with you for years in Northern California. 
you need to get another crew out here because there's not enough people to do the work. And he's like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but there, there, so I had to use other applicators that were using a Pebble product. Mm-hmm. It was not Pebble Tech. Still and, way better than a lot of surfaces, no matter sure. what. I would, in fact, I'm just going to just say that if you want a long-term interior finish in your pool, one that is durable, one that is forgiving, one that allows you to make a mistake from timer a time or two or 40, um, do an aggregate finish. Now, obviously, Mike and I, you know, we believe in the Pebble Technology products, but there's there's other good products out there. Right. But they're just separating themselves from everybody else, which is what companies do, and they require a certification process. Right. So what I was just going to say is I could throw the sample in those other pools and I could find it. Yeah. So because they, and the reason they cost less is because they didn't finish the product as much. And mm-hmm. the more you finish it, the better the finish is. So, uh, but yes, plaster a pebble any pebble finish is far superior to a plaster finish absolutely it's just very right. very durable yeah so plaster has changed radically in the last 40 years so what you're getting today is something that's going to stain it's going to erode quicker so it's going to be rougher uh, the life expectancy is much shorter than any pebble product right and with the with say a plaster pool in, in Arizona, in Southern California, I'm assuming, probably Florida the same way here, you drain that pool. And we're not talking to talk about the pitfalls of draining a pool uh, in areas with uh, water um, tables. But the, the plaster itself, if you drain that pool, in about 10 days, it'll dry out, start peeling off, and you're toast. You're chipping it out and redoing it. With a pebble pool, it's possible that pool could be drained for six months acid wash it, fill it back up and it's fine. It's just that durable. It's a, it's a great product Mm -hmm. and worth every penny. I did have a question that came in also. So this is a good time to ask that or have we covered pebble? No, I think it's a great time. Okay. So the question that came in is when is the best time to build? I have my opinion about that. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'd like your perspective. I guess this is poolside perspectives, isn't it? Yes, sir. So I believe I believe that the best time to build a pool for construction is actually in the wintertime. It's not as hot. Um, concrete hydrates slower. The watering is not as critical, although it is critical. And then the th- one of the things I explain to my clients anyway is just think about the psychology here. I mean... You're working outside when it's 115 degrees out. It's 140 in the bottom of that pool. It's miserable. And I can't help but think that people are in a bigger hurry when it's hot rather than when it's relatively comfortable to work in. I think it's just human nature. I'm not saying that that people do a worse job. I'm just saying we're human beings. Working out in that heat, working out in that environment, it's harsh. It's tough. There's less capabilities uh, for performing at a high level mm-hmm. when you're at that heat just because products uh, cure faster, mm-hmm. uh, set up faster, so there's less time. Now, one of the things I would say is I, I think that is a correct answer in this part of the country. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand what I tell people is you, you want to look at when your greatest stress comes from. Yep. Okay. So if you have horribly freezing temperatures in the winter time, well then by all means, that's not the best time to build. Although there are pool companies that build 12 months out of the year in Canada. Okay. So those Canadians, they, they have a different process that they go mm-hmm. through. Uh, just like, We have to deal with things on a different process when it's 108 degrees outside than when we do when it's 40 degrees outside. Absolutely. So, but you're going to get your best performance when you're away from the greatest stress would be, I would think. Although my opinion on when the best time to build is, is now. I agree. I was going to say that actually. But, you know, here's another thing I I, I think that's important. And that is that, um, in the wintertime, there's not as many pools being built 
because notoriously people wait to the last minute to decide if they want to pull. Sure, it's a- and this is yet another reason why Mike and I embarked on this adventure was we're trying to compel you to think a little bit sooner about getting a pool and then working through a process in order to get it. Because if you wait to the last minute, March, April, May, and you're hoping to swim for July 4th, I mean, there's a lot of companies that, yeah, they'll do that. And they're jamming hundreds of pools a month with a lot of the same crews. That's just a business model and that's fine. But the question was, when's the best time to build a pool? And I'm saying in the wintertime, you have better weather unless it's raining. I mean, you're going to have pros and cons no matter what. Sure. And then the psychology part of it. Well, you're going to be able to enjoy the pool. In, in the, the next summer, the, sure. The next summer. Now, the reason I say now is some projects take months to build. Yeah, and or longer. Some, some projects take a lot longer than mm-hmm. months to build. And so the sooner you start the process, the sooner you're going to be able to enjoy that space. And a lot of times people are like, well, you know, if we finish it in October, are we going to really use it? Yes, you will. Because your outdoor living space and your pool environment are going to change how you live. So the spring and the summer and the fall and the winter all have different activities that take place at a higher rate. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to swim predominantly in the summertime, but I'm going to cook out and entertain predominantly in the spring and the fall, and some some in the winter, some in the summer, but the spring and the fall are the great times to entertain because it's not too hot and it's not too cold. That's fair. So, you know, in the wintertime, we've got, you know, our fire pits and the s'mores and the hot tub, you know, and all that activity that take place. So... You know, regardless of when you finish your project, it's going to be a great time to finish your project. That's very true. So, but as for supply and demand, you're a hundred percent right. There's more demand in the summertime than there is any other time. And that's where I was going. That's what I, where I lost my train of thought was you're going to have a lot less production in the wintertime. So now you're dealing with crews that maybe aren't trying to do two or three jobs a day in some parts of the country and they're doing one. Right. And it's just my philosophy that because we are human beings and we are affected by the environment, that there's a a very comfortable time to work. And there's a time that, man, I just want to get done. The other thing is a lot of times people are like, well, I'm going to wait till I get a better interest rate. Or that that's a thought process and as you go through when I'm going to build my pool. Well, I think another one is I'm going to wait until prices come down. And I've been in this industry for over 30 years and not once have the prices ever come down. Not a single time. No. It, it typically is the supply cost is going to constantly increase. Mm-hmm. The labor like cost everything else. is constantly going to increase. So the, the sooner you start your project, the cheaper it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And the more you're going to enjoy it. Absolutely. So, but that's a good question. It's a great consider. question. So, uh, do I need, so I, I had a question have, that came in, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. And another one, the question that we're came getting in, a lot of them now. So, it, well, and it really helps, uh, for you, the audience to send in your questions. Yeah. Get so engaged now. If you go to the website, there's an ask a question button. You push that button and you ask your question. And if we pick it and read it on the air and answer it, then we're going to send you some cool stuff. So, uh, so send those questions in and we'll get them answered. So this question came in and it says, do I need a fence around my pool? Oh, good question. So I would say, yes, you need to have some sort of fence around your pool. So the universal building code Mm -hmm. states that your property with a swimming pool must have a fence around it. Mm -hmm. Now, what is considered a fence is changed somewhat from city to city, a lot of, or or state to state. So most states include the walls of the house as part of your fence barrier. Sure. So we're talking about whether or not you need to have a fence around the property or a separate fence around the entire pool. Well, it could be two different things. That's yes. true. So there's actually places where people have had to do both. So I was going to say some states yeah. do require that there be a barrier between the house and the pool. Mm-hmm. Regard so as, as 
Little Johnny goes out the door into the outdoor space. There's a fence that's going to stop him from getting in the, in the pool area. And most states say, well, we're going to require you to have some alarm on your door that's going to notify you when little Johnny goes out the door. And so we're not going to require you to put a fence there. So you have to have a fence around the property to protect people on the outside from coming and using your pool. And there's specifics on that fence and how it's designed or built. So most of them specify that a gate has to swing out. Absolutely. So when somebody pushes up against it, it latches automatically instead of swings and opens, invites you into the backyard. Uh, It also specifies the latch has to be at a certain height. 54 inches above grade. Correct. And the the pickets that are in between have to be a a, a maximum of a certain distance. Four inches. Can't be more than four inches. Correct. The other thing is you can't have horizontal bars that you can step on to climb over. Because they're called climbable. In fact, some cities require that you put something in the neighbor's yard on the middle rail of a wood fence to prevent someone from climbing over it. That's interesting. I had a, a subdivision in, in Queen Creek, Arizona, that the developers built um, walls around all of the properties, but they were also built as view fences. So there's a three-foot CMU wall with a two-foot wrought iron on top of it. That didn't meet the code. So every one of those people in that community that had a swimming pool had to have a separate fence around their pool. Wow. Because you could climb. Right. The three foot section mm-hmm. and then climb over the two. Yeah, so they were not happy about that. No, I'm sure they weren't. So some cities require a four foot fence. Some mm-hmm. require five. Some require a six. So well, definitely different depending on city, locale. Right. municipality for sure. So one thing also that some cities requires where you have an automatic gate that opens to say an alleyway mm-hmm. that they require a fence between the driveway and the backyard. Right. So you can't open the gate and automatically walk into the, the backyard swimming pool area. Sure. Makes sense. Oh, so lots of things that make sense. Now, some people are like, well, how come I saw a picture of somebody and they don't have a fence. They probably took it out after the pool was built and after the final inspection. So in the wild, wild west of Texas, okay, if you're not in a city jurisdiction and you're in the county, there is no enforcement of codes. Or an unincorporated city. Oh, and I should say that's not true with all counties, Mm -hmm. but some of the counties. And so... Some people built the pool, they lived in the county, and then the property was annexed into the city, and they didn't have to put a fence up. Yeah, because there's such a thing as grandfathering. Right. So that could be why you see no fence. But generally, when there's a pool installed across the street from the neighborhood pond, (laughs) which is not fenced, correct? you still have to have a fence for general safety of the your inhabitants and the inhabitants that are around you. That's very true, Mike. Yeah. Very true. You could have them right on top of one another and you as a homeowner, you've got to have a fence, but that community that's got that anybody can access that body of water, they don't need one. No. So not our rules, just the rules that exist. So, well, but there is a project here in Prosper, one of my favorite projects going off on another tangent here. And that pool looks like a lake. But it has a fence. It has a fence. That is exactly right. That's where I was going with that. Yeah. So I believe because it is a sanitized body of water, mm. that that's where the city went with it when they were uh, in, incorporating and trying to build that. So that, mm. I think that's the story I heard. Mm. But We got any other questions? Oh, we have lots of questions. Oh, yeah. Let's keep rolling here. So, but we need to break these up, Kerwin. So we will act as these are individual questions. How often do I need to have my pool cleaned? Well, that depends a little bit on some environmental factors and usage factors, but typically most pools are serviced. If you have a service company come once a week, I generally tell my clients because I think everybody needs to understand how their pool works. I think leaving it up to somebody else and there's a lot of great people out there is just not wise understand how your pool works. But, you know, I think that pools, at least the water chemistry should be adjusted twice a week. 
at a minimum. Because really what happens when you have weekly service is you elevate your sanitation up as high as possible that's safe. And as the week goes by, it comes down so that the next week they're doing the same thing. So the pools actually are service like this. And I'm saying if you do twice a week, it's more like this. And you can maintain more consistent um, chemicals, more consistent everything in the pool. So if you have a automatic sanitation system, does that help? Could. Mm -hmm. So flatline that a little bit. Yeah. So right now we're in the leaf wars at my house. You're in what? Leaf wars. Oh, I'm sure. You so, got 500 oak trees on your property, don't you? 83. Uh, so the 83 oak trees are deciding to shed. I'm sure. And so with the shedding, the cleaning of my pool right now is twice a day. Mm -hmm. So I think I, it's one of the reasons why the, the um, ground is in the condition that it's in in so many places because of all the organic material that gets saturated into the ground here. That's a geology lesson that I really won't dive down into right now. <laughs> but, you know, I tell people when my pool was built, N4 cleaning did not work on leaves. It, well, it doesn't work on leaves that well. So It does work, but we have some limitations. Okay. And most of these floor systems, most of these cleaning systems are, are meant to operate under normal conditions. And the... Uh, ridding of all the leaves in the wintertime in North Texas or in other parts of the country is not considered normal. So you're going to have a, some more stuff to do. 84 oak trees, yes, do require me to go out. So I didn't do in four cleaning because all it, when I did it, there wasn't a leaf trapper that existed. Or main drain that they would go down. Right. So neither one of those were in play. So we built our pool. I was like, well, this would be a train wreck to do in four cleaning. So we used a Polaris. But even with the Polaris... I'm going to have to go out, you know, in the morning, clean skimmers, clean leaves off the top, come back in the evening, clean skimmers, clean leaves off the top. And for me, that goes on for about three to four weeks. Yeah. And after three to four weeks is over, then I'm done. But some people in my neighborhood come in and put, they've already put their cover on their pool and it's a seasonal cover that they leave it there for till spring. Mm-hmm. And basically it keeps the leaves out of their swimming pool. It's like a trampoline cover. Like a loop lock. A, a loop lock is one of the brands that, mm -hmm. that that is used. And so that, that's a solution that helps keep pools cleaner. So uh, how often should you clean a pool depends on the season. And it would depend on the debris that's around your pool. Uh, but those are, you know, good things to consider on what works best. Well, and, and I think a, an important thing to remember about in-floor cleaning systems, and this is the how I've always explained it to people, is an in-floor cleaning system also happens to be the ultimate circulation system because we're circulating from the bottom up. So you might have a few times of the year or at least one time during the year, whereas it's a hassle, but the rest of the year, it works amazing if it's designed, installed and engineered the right way. And it is the best cleaning system that there is because there's not a hose cleaner that has been designed just yet that will bounce up the steps and benches, hop over into the spa, clean the spa, and then jump back into the pool. If somebody can come up with one of those, then we might have something. That would be interesting. Okay. Great question, though. So we had a question from Nick, and Nick wrote in from Keller, Texas. And Nick wanted to know, do we do all of our work in-house? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, there's different ways that people set up their business model to do work, yep. as in construction work. I, I'm guessing is what Nick is referencing. Yep. And so some people choose to do, so and I worked for Jeremy of Pools out in Sacramento, California. We did everything in-house, and we had fourth-generation employees mm -hmm. that worked for us. Uh we had three generations on one deck crew. Wow. Okay. So we had a lot of people that were really skilled at their situation. And we built probably 400 pools a year. So a lot. We, were, we were building a lot of pools back in the 90s. And so there was two things that we didn't do in-house. And one was uh, the pool finish. Uh, Interior finish, plaster. Be because we did plaster and we did pebble sheen. So we didn't do that in-house. 
And then we also uh, did not do uh, auto covers in house. That was somebody else that did that. But other than that, we did everything in house. That's impressive. So it took a very large organization of hundreds of people, uh, tons of trucks and things like that. But this was a company that just now, this last year, turned 100 years old. Wow. And so Impressive. They, they had a huge investment in that situation. But Mike did a great job. So uh, Mike Jeremy. Uh, That's what I meant. Yes. So, But I'm sure you did a great job. Too. Uh, well, he, Mike Jeremy had taught me a lot of what I know. So the... The cool thing is there was not as broad of a spectrum of requirements on materials to be used mm -hmm. during those times. I mean, we had 12 tiles to pick from. Sure. Times were different. We had, you know, basically one deck type that was used, which was a aggregate deck and it was cantilevered over all the way to the edge of the pool. Uh, so there, there was very, and we did a lot of, boulder work or precast and, th and that was basically it so th there was not as many skill sets or, or needed mm -hmm. but you know the hydraulics the steel the gunite we did all those things in-house so there's some people that do that but that takes a, a large investment to do all that in-house if you're going to have some people that are specialized or you could have do it in-house but you have to have a person that's skilled at a lot of different things sure so. Sure. And that's one business model. Another business model is some companies operate, you know, literally as brokers, they're brokering a transaction between, you know, them and their vendors and the homeowner. And so they have somebody coming in, you know, from outside the organization. And then there would be the hybrids that do some of the stuff in-house and then contract some of the other things. And, you know, the point is there's some things that don't make any sense to do in-house for most companies because of the investment and the capital required in order to do it. You know, in Phoenix, most pool companies there don't do a whole lot in-house. We have a lot of captive sub contractors or as I like calling them trade partners because they're, I didn't ever consider them subs to us. I mean, they just, you know, they're part of the team. And so there's lots of different ways to do this. And it's, it's a good question to ask, you know, your designer, how does your company operate? You know, and then there's, there's, you know, those that say, well, if you do everything in house, it's easy to cover up your mistakes. Well, I, maybe, you know, but I don't think in this case, there is a best way that it is based geographically to some degree because people in the Northeast do a lot of stuff in house. It sounds like Northern California is the same way. And then depending on the type of pool, I mean, there's obviously we haven't even gone down this road of the different types of pools, but if we're talking concrete pools, like we're talking about, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Well, in some parts of the country, they build all three types. They mm -hmm. do fiberglass, they do vinyl, they do concrete. So, you know, the, the skill sets to do all those things are a little bit different. So, but you know, if you have a, a larger company, sometimes they can specialize. You have, particular people that do something at a very high degree of level and skill set. And so if your demands are uh, to do very unique things, sometimes it's better to deal with a specialist. Agreed. So uh, versus somebody that's not done something every day and, and has the diversity to do a lot of different things, but they usually do one thing really well and mm -hmm. some other things they do okay at. So uh, that that's, you know, again, but it depends on the part of country that you're working in and, and the, the amount of projects that you have the people, you know, working on those. Absolutely. So anyway, so th there's a lot of different ways to handle it. Um, there's some ideal ways, but, you know, it, it depends on where you're at. So mm -hmm. anyway. And most so. companies, I think, are going to try to figure out what's best for them. And based, based upon their clientele and, and their location, absolutely. Oh, thanks for the question, Nick. Yes. I have a question for you. you it's not from me. It's from somebody else. Okay. And I think it's a great question because I answer this all the time. I love it. And it's, Kevin, how involved are you in my project from start to finish? Do you just design the pool and move on to the next cell? So you're asking me how I would answer that question? Well, I'm question? not asking myself. You're not asking yourself. <laughs> no, I, I was presenting it Kevin, as to how a homeowner. Yes. No, Kevin, Kevin, would you do Yes, that? no, yes, no. All right, make fun of me. 
have made choices during my career to perform in a certain way. And I choose to see things built, which I enjoy that. One so, of the reasons we get along. So I do not travel because I would not be able to see things built at the level and frequency that I have. So by staying here where there's plenty of work, I'm blessed in that aspect. Mm -hmm. and I'm in an area where there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of demand for swimming pools and outdoor living is I get to see those projects go together. Uh, I like to see how the pieces to go together. So I love to see at the end the clients using it. So I, I stay involved in a project because I, I like to see how things are done. Now, some of the things that I stay involved with the project because I'm very busy and sometimes I don't communicate every single little detail as clearly as it should be done. And so then there's questions and they're like, Hey Mike, you got to come answer this. Or there's things that sometimes happen mm -hmm. in processes. That, hey, I got to go answer this. So, you know, that, that's not necessarily fun, but it's necessary. So we can keep the vision as we thought it would be. But the, uh, so I, I'm involved quite a bit. The only way to do it. Well, there's different ways to do no, it. No, I'm, I'm saying that this is the best way to do it when your designer is involved with you from start to finish. So I'll say that. Okay. Well, that's your perspective. <laughs> so okay. the, the choice is, the, the other thing is if your designer's involved, well, in the ideal world, he's working with a great team. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you've got a great synergy on your project and you, you'll end up in a great place. So anyway. Well, at the end of the day, Mike, we're just trying to do the same thing, which is we want the homeowner to get what they asked for, what they wanted, what they thought we were going to get it. And we become the conduit because the challenge is, of course, if you're not on the job, and this is why I said what I said, is how does everybody interpret your plans? How does everybody execute your plans? Right. And we've got a gazillion different design scenarios on a million different types of properties with all kinds of soil conditions. All I'm saying is I believe that the best case scenario is that your designer stays with you from start to finish. Well, that's really beneficial if you have someone that's been through a lot of different experiences mm -hmm. and they have some uh, good and bad things to draw on from the past to help guide you through that process. I love the comment, good and bad, because, yep, you learn through some of the mistakes. I mean, so there's, there's people that are going to be great designers and they're going to be involved with you, but they may not have been through all the, you know, fun and fire and know all the different things to do because they haven't experienced it yet. So some of it fair. is you, you try to uh, pass. That. I mean, that's why we teach. So to try to pass some of that on as well. So yeah, absolutely. Well, good, good example. Thank you for uh, your thought process today. <laughs>